Kale just got her nails done and she keeps clicking. Uh, oh, I don't mean to do it intentionally. I, I'm not sure. It might sound like an interesting AM, ASMR uh, show yeah. on, the, on our live stream. I did. Look how funky they are. Very funky nails. Yeah, oh, black and yellow because I have a whole bunch of competitions coming up next month and I need to represent. My dog's name is Beeline, if you didn't know. Yeah. So we have a lot of bee-themed things around this, uh, around this place. We do. We do. <laughs> Now we're diving into uh, training. We need to talk about the first thing, and uh, the mm -hmm. first shortcut that so many puppy owners make, and this is especially important. I'll tell you what: if you have a dog who you just started training with, if you have a dog who's like maybe like in their adolescence, if you have a teenage dog, um, this is really important. I want you to be really taking uh, stock, I guess, of uh, 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 this point because so many people are not are taking a shortcut when it comes to supervision. And it's really setting them back. This is often where we start to, uh, some, some of the, uh, the challenges come up like chewing on stuff, uh, having accidents, uh, you know, pee and poop in the house. Uh, people that are, you know, ha have a dog that's maybe even like in the backyard barking like crazy. Uh, these are all supervision problems. And mm -hmm. when you take a shortcut with supervision, you start, the dog starts, it's not clear. It's not clear to them what you like, what you don't like, what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. Let's talk a little bit about supervision. When it comes to like the foundational puppy training process, we have a super chat that I'm going to grab. Yeah, actually, um, I was just reading the super chat. I don't know. It actually is very in line oh. with the first topic. Yeah, so I don't Leah. know if we want to okay. go to it now. Well, how appropriate. Uh, do you want a toot for the toot? I do. I do want to toot. Dropping a toot. <laughs> So that wasn't as good as my first one. There's a well-timed super chat uh, from Le Leah. Uh, my nine-month-old 80-pound husky won't stop killing my chickens. Is she salvageable or should I rehome her? She's killed five and eat, eight, eaten four. I'm desperate. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. That is, um, that is stressful for sure. Um, but... The supervision is really important here because when we are able to, of course, you need to know what to do when you are supervising her, but you need to kind of think about like how, how is she getting to the chickens in the first place to be able to actually chase them or kill them or whatever. So she's showing you that she needs um, a lot less freedom in this situation. So when you're out with her and you're around where the chickens are, it's really, really important that you are supervising her very, very, very closely. Mostly. Yeah. Um, I would also highly recommend that you don't have her off leash. Maybe put her on a long line um, until you can train a reliable response to name or a reliable recall so that if she decides to go towards them and you call her and she decides that chickens are more exciting than you, which chickens are pretty exciting, um, she isn't actually able to to uh, get there. Um, I think I'm just saying it's, 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 that she's jumping the fence. The fence. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you definitely need to um, be keeping her on leash or line so that if she even goes towards the fence, you can stop her from doing that. You need to break this habit um, by having more control over her. Don't give her so much opportunity. Um, supervision is going to be key, but supervision is really not helpful if you're not actively supervising, if you're not actually doing something. Um, lots of dogs have, have high prey drive. You know, yeah. um, chickens are, are very exciting. Um, actually, um, at our training school, we have a neighbor who has um, free range uh, chickens, and it is not uncommon for like 25 chickens to come trotting along yeah. right where we um, exercise our dogs. Um, so we've had to make sure that our dogs have a reliable recall and they understand to leave it so that if the chickens are come by obviously dogs are always going to have that innate nature to chase after something that they want to so again those of you listening this could apply to deer this could apply to rabbits this could apply to whatever yeah. that internal instinct totally. they want to go uh, so i love where your head's at right now and i think it's really valuable for uh, you at home is uh it could be a dog it could be a person it could mm -hmm. be a car it doesn't matter what the thing is um the other challenge that Leah's got right now is that her dogs found value yes. in getting the chickens. You know, he's been successful with his crime. This is very. This is really not that different than jumping up on a counter yeah. and getting a sandwich or something like that, Leah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's a little more terrible because sandwiches. If they die, it's okay. Yeah, but it's sandwich can't chickens, run away. Chickens, it's not so great. <laughs> right. So uh, this is really important. You know, when if you're the talking sandwich about sandwich can't run away. When you're talking. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't let that one go. That was good. Uh, when you're talking about um, retraining this, uh, supervision is crucial. Yeah. Absolutely crucial. Because your dog, 
feels, if you're, for all of you, it doesn't matter what the problem behavior is, if it feels right, your dog's gonna do it. They'll yeah. think it's right. In absence of information, if they're not told that they can't do that and this is what you'd rather have them do, they're gonna think whatever feels good is the right thing. And remember, these are dogs. You know, dogs are meant to do that kind of thing. Like, you know, if without us, that's the right choice. You know, that's mm -hmm. the choice uh, that a dog is going to make. We have to work pretty darn hard to teach them to sit at our side. We have to work pretty darn hard to teach them to walk on leash, to listen to us because, you know, there is a, a value in the rest of the world. So we need to teach them that it's worth not getting to the chickens. We need to teach yeah. them it's worth listening, whatever the situation is. So supervision is going to be crucial for this. So I'm imagining, and again, let's just paint a, a, a picture, you know, make up a story for, for this situation. But let's say, you know, uh, Leah lets her dog out in the backyard um, to, you know, do their business. And that's when the fence gets jumped. That's when the chickens get chased and eaten. Uh, you, you can't let your husky be out there on their own until they've learned to not jump the fence, to not attack the chickens. Supervision is going to be critical for, for, you know, at this point in their training because yeah. it's just so darn valuable. For sure. Uh, Mary H. Dropping the $4 Hi, super Mary. sticker. Very... I love when you turn our lights blue. I know, yeah. Mary's turning the lights blue. Oh, you know what? I may not have oh, plugged yeah. in those lights again. I'm going to have to go turn them That's on. That's sad. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that, the next point, uh, yeah. why is that? Yeah, so the next uh, shortcut that we're going to talk about is um, <clears throat> not paying enough attention to management tools. Um, and I think this actually goes in line quite nicely with uh, supervision because um, just like I mentioned, um, Leah, when supervising her husky, needed to have a leash or a line on so she could actually address behaviors the same thing goes for management you know in your backyard or in your house and um, I think sometimes a shortcut that people take is they either eliminate some of those training tools too early or they don't use them enough in the beginning and some of those training tools might be having a house line or a leash on in the house utilizing a crate when you can't supervise maybe um, having some baby gates up so that you can restrict access in your home until your pup or your dog is a little bit more reliable maybe you use all three of those tools like we do five alive you know had a line on in the kitchen he had a crate in the kitchen and he was barricaded in the kitchen with with baby gates so it was really easy for us to manage him and help him make good choices or address bad choices when he would make one. Um, so it's really important that you don't bypass those steps. I, th I think it is easy to bypass those steps because it's a lot of work to manage a dog and yeah, sometimes sure. we're busy doing things and you just kind of want to get your thing done and we don't realize that during that time our dogs are getting into mischief or they're creating bad habits or they're you know chewing on the table leg and that's very satisfying so they keep repeating it as you can see there's a bit of a theme going on here um so it's really important that you don't cut corners in terms of your management with your dog and i think a common question that we often get asked well how long do i have to have a leash on my dog uh, on the dog in the house or outside or how long do i have to use a crate for um and it's really impossible to answer that because it depends on the dog a little bit but what it really depends on is you. It depends on you. How reliable are you at giving good information? Um, you know, are you consistent? Do you have good follow through? Are you a good manager? Are you training your dog to make better choices? Um, you know, there's lots of times you can not have to do those things and you can, you know, quickly eliminate them, but uh, it really depends on the type of information that you're giving. So don't cut corners on that one, that the management's gonna be essential for your dog's behavior in the home. Or so, outside. Yeah, uh, and this is also critical when it, it, it's so easy to just not, be, to think to yourself like, oh boy, uh, I'm tired, I'm busy, mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to attach the house line. Yeah. You know, I'm tired uh, or He'll you know, be fine. the kids are, the kids yeah. are, you know, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the situation is. And to think I'm going to go outside to uh, take my dog out to potty and I'm not going to put a leash on them this time just because the leash is in the other room. Well, these are the kinds of shortcuts that are like gonna turn your training around because all it takes is one opportunity for your dog to realize that they don't have to listen. They don't have to listen. They can choose on their own whatever they want to choose. Yeah. And um, without great management, um, it doesn't give you a lot, it doesn't give you an opportunity to like help them discover that it's not really an option. Like, you know, I don't want you to have that option. All, everything that's great comes from me. 
you know, ch chasing the cat, uh, it could be pretty exciting. But if you have a house line on the dog, you can stop that behavior. Then you can teach them what you want them to do. You can show them that you're valuable. I know uh, Kale often says, you know, we really want our dogs to learn that the sun shines out of our ears. And, <laughs> I like um, that and I, I like that saying as well. Um, but I think it, I think a lot of people undervalue that, you mm -hmm. know, they think that, you know, um, I don't know that they don't realize the importance of you being the best part of your dog's day mm -hmm. of you being the person, the bringer of all things good and someone they have to listen to. Uh, because in this human world, they can get all, in all kinds of situations that are dangerous, that uh, you know are you, you know not um, desirable, jumping up on people and jumping up on elderly people or whatever. Um, you really want to work your butt off to show your dog that you're worth listening to, and then they will start to choose you. They'll start to choose you as the option, mm -hmm. the, you know, rather than going for the you know uh, pulling at the end of the leash, uh, jumping up on people, chasing the cat. Um. Somebody had a question about like how long do we have to hold or are we supposed to hold the house line in the house? Uh, no, actually you're not. Oh, the house line uh, is just supposed to drag behind the dog. It's a way for you to kind of step on it and then um, and then do whatever you need to. Um, if the dog requires a bit more control, then we would suggest you actually use, a, you know, say people were coming in the house and you needed more control during that circumstance. I would switch out my everyday house line for an actual leash so I could put it in my hands and go through the proper steps. But just for hanging out in the house and, and having that additional way of uh, getting a hold of the dog, we suggest having them drag a house line four feet, no handle, so it slips and slides easily. But that way, if they decide to boot behind the couch or they grab something and take off running or they put their paws up on the counter or whatever it might be, we don't recommend grabbing the actual dog. Um, we think it's far more effective to grab a house line and then redirect the dog from there. Often, if you're grabbing, physically grabbing the actual dog, some dogs think it's a party um, and other dogs get a bit worried by that some dogs take off and run and that becomes a catch me if you can game um, and that sort of um, affects your leadership status so house lines are just meant to be dragged around put your foot on it but then if you want to actually train through something switch it out for your actual training leash so you have more control um this uh, <clears throat> i want to say one more thing yeah I don't know if you're gonna like this or not, but I'm gonna say it anyways, because it's a strong belief of mine. Um, there is uh, quite a few people giving dog training advice in the chat, which is great. I think it's great to share, but I just wanna make sure that everybody watching knows that we are not advocates in any way of e-collars. And there's a few suggestions about um, suggesting to others to use e-collars. You can write whatever you wish to, but I think it's important it's that you guys idea. know yeah. that that is not our stance. And I, just so you know, those are not, anybody in blue would be giving Giving, it, giving advice that that we would that would be in line with our methods, obviously, because they're our instructors. But it was just important for me to say that because I would hate for somebody to leave and think that that was something that we stood yeah, behind. Yeah, no, that's an important thing to talk about because I think uh, e-collars used incorrectly, like with poor timing, mm -hmm. could really ruin a dog. Yeah, and that's so often what happens. Yeah, um, you know, it's just not a, it's not an appropriate tool for family dog training yeah. at all. And um, it's we strongly advise against using stuff like that. The other yeah. thing, prong collars, bad idea. Yeah. You don't need it. Yeah. Um, and we've proven over 40 years, 100,000, more than 100,000 dogs in our training facility, uh, that you, you, know, you don't have to rely on some of these aversive tools yeah. to get the results you want. And would you really want that? Because your dog, rather than, you know, to avoid the pain, they're going to listen. No, I want my dog to listen because they want to. Listen because I'm you know, exciting. Listen, because, you know, it's fun and I've shown them, I've proven the value mm -hmm. of, uh, of, uh, you know, training and listening. So that's, that's a, you know, pretty strong stance that we take. Um, mm -hmm. so I think it was good that you brought that up. Now, uh, getting back to the management side of things. I love this question. Coffee chat says, so in other words, a leash helps my dog focus better when training. Absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> but it's because the what it's it's all about what you do. So yeah. leash doesn't leash doesn't do anything. It's just a you know it, we have beautiful leather leashes. It just, it just keeps your dog. Yeah, it keeps your from, dog with you from leaving you. Yeah. yeah, it it limits the opportunity your dog has, and options that your dog has. But it's all about what you do with that time. 
to get better focus, you're going to make better choices, set up the situation better. You're going to use a lot of the things that we talk about in, uh, you know, a lot of our videos and in our training with like motion, voice, uh, you know, um, starting at a foundational level. That's really how you're going to get the yeah. success. That's how you're going to get more focus. So it's really important to understand that there's no tool that's going to fix a problem. House line, leash, crate, these things are all management tools. And they're the things we're going to use to set our dogs up to want to listen. They're the things that we're going to use to, uh, you know, show our dogs that it's worth it's it's worth their time. It's worth them making the right choice to listen to us. Yeah. Um, so I do love that. Uh, I do love that point. It's an imp important point to make. Now we have a super chat somewhere here from not Ilea, uh from David White. Mm. So David asks, I got a six-week-old golden retriever. What should I teach first? Oh, we have some fantastic videos on this. We do. Uh, but we'll give you a Coles Note version right now. Um, when you have a brand new puppy, the best things to work on first are anything that's going to um, build relationship between you and your puppy. And yeah. that's such a, a big statement because it sort of means, you know, so many things to so many people. But you're going to start off with some basics. Um, some people would say start with things like sit and down and things like that. But I'm actually going to be even more um, specific. Start off by teaching your puppy how to follow food um, so that, you know, they can lure so you eventually can manipulate them into a sit, a down, whatever. Um, you know, lots of puppies don't really know how to follow food. Teach them what the word yes means. Um you know, practice um, getting them comfortable with the house by making sure the house is set up to make sure that they're not getting into places that they shouldn't. Um, you could do a little bit of tug with them to get some energy out and to let them use their mouth a little bit. Um, start with crate training right away. Get Start with the crate immediately. Don't work your way into it. Just get going immediately. Um, there's a few basic things that you should do before you start working on obedience. Um, but um, yeah, Dan's shared a um, three things every puppy needs to learn first. A video, so you can check that out. But I would just start on some of the basics like that. Okay, um, Pedro, we're going to get to your super chat in just a moment, but I saw this and I thought it was really good. I thought this was really important, especially for tonight's topic. So basically, uh, uh, train like I'm raising a toddler. Lots of positive feedback, <laughs> art of distraction for the bad stuff. Yes yeah. <laughs> and no. Let's talk a little bit about like when the puppy gets into trouble, what are we doing? Like what? So the puppy starts chewing on a shoe. You know, what are we doing? Yeah, so you do want to be careful that you don't for too long just focus on redirecting your puppy to a new distraction um, because sometimes smart puppies and a lot of puppies are really smart they will sort of learn oh when i chew on this this slipper all of a sudden mom comes over and she gives me a toy so i'm now figuring out that chewing slippers equals getting right. toys and that's really great so um the uh, art of distraction for bad stuff is great but you want to try and do that before the dog gets into mischief and if it works out that the dog does grab something that they're not supposed to or they do do something they're not supposed to which will happen because that's just you know part of having a puppy yeah. um you want to redirect them with that house line away from that item and then get them to do some type of um control behavior you know we like asking the puppy to sit or um working it down or something that sort of puts you in the driver's seat and then from there give them something new to chew so that it's not replacing it it's stopping it addressing the behavior closing that conversation and then moving to a new thing. Yeah. It just sort of stops any vicious circles um, from starting uh, from your puppy's perspective. Yeah, and I thought uh, bringing this up was a, a good uh, a good time because the next point that we're going to talk about has a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. and before we get there, let's talk about uh, Pedro. Pedro Super Chat, thank you for the Super Chat. Can you indicate some dog breeds that suffer less from anxiety, separation, this, and congrats? So dog breeds that suffer less from anxiety separation. Now this has a lot more to do mm. with your, um, the steps that you take to ensure that your dog is comfortable when they're on their own than it does the actual breed. I think we should maybe speak to that. Yeah, um, 
you know, there's lots of questions that we get asked about specific breeds and their tendencies and, you know, or like, well, I have a beagle, so he sniffs a lot or whatever it might be. And the thing is, when you see as many dogs as we do, you really start to recognize that there is such a wide range of personality types within a breed. Um, so I don't really want to directly say that the, there's some breeds that suffer less than others um, because every every breed is going to have some type of problem over here and then not over there we even see it in litter mates we have yeah. you know people that come to classes all the time with puppies from the exact same litter one puppy super confident one puppy is maybe a little bit more worried so um no i can't really indicate some dog breeds that suffer no. less from uh separation anxiety um i think what you will probably need to do is learn more about separation anxiety and what um, can bring those things on um, so that you learn to avoid those things with the dogs because any dog can be like that. Sometimes their nature is, you know, more like that. Confidence obviously is a big part of that, um, but you need to learn about separated anxiety itself so that you know um, how to avoid accidentally your dog develop, uh, developing it. Michelle Davis, thank you for the super chat. Our moderators are going to be keeping an eye out um, for a question or a comment if you had something. Jane Silverman dropping the $50 super chat. Wow. Thank you very much. That's very, very nice. Yes. It's too much. We do appreciate it. But question, comment, uh, I'd love to uh, know what uh, what's on your mind. Um, talking about the shortcuts that people take, and th this is a huge one. We've talked a little bit about it, specifically when it came to um, uh, the, like the puppy chewing on stuff or shoes or whatever, yeah. um, being inconsist inconsistent with your training. Now, this is where this is where the transition from like act, like training skills and doing stuff and then taking it out into the real world is often where things completely fall apart. Or something like training the name, something like uh, it doesn't really matter what the thing is. Maybe it's jumping up, nipping and biting. This is yep. a common problem is being inconsistent with your expectations. And maybe one member of the family just is totally okay with the dog chewing their hands mm -hmm. off um, when everyone else is like, we're struggling to get through this. And the puppy has sharp, needly teeth. But we need to talk about consistency in Needly. the household with uh, puppy training. Yes, I think that nipping and biting is a great example. I think jumping up is a really good example. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, because I think sometimes, you know, you're busy or people are trying to come in the house and puppies over here and there's people coming in. There's lots going on. And sometimes, you know, pressing pause on life to train the, the puppy isn't always you know, at the forefront of our mind. Um, but dogs really do um, excel with consistent information. Um, and they can also really um, fail miserably with consistent information if that information isn't good right. that they are consistently getting. Yeah. So, um, you know, if they're rehearsing something a lot and that's consistently happening, they're going to learn bad things just as just as quickly as they're going to learn um, that they're going to learn good things. So consistency is important. Um, and then circling back to like supervision and management, um, think about times when you do need to um, get done what you need to do. You don't need to puppy train in every single situation. Maybe you do have people coming to the house and that is a common time or your dog might bark or they might jump up on people. Well, instead of letting that happen or instead of working through it in that moment, if you don't have the brain power or the patience to do so, go and put them in their crate with a nice bone to chew or Kong filled with delicious goods so that you're avoiding the situation from happening. So you're stopping the bad rehearsal um, and then you're putting time into the good rehearsal when you're actually ready to focus on it. But being consistent is terribly, terribly difficult because people in general are not very, we're not very consistent you know, beings. Yeah. And so you kind of need to have a bit of a training plan. You need to have a game plan for some of these unwanted behaviors. So when they come up, you actually know what you're going to do about it. And that allows you to be more consistent. I love, um, you mentioned in there, um, sometimes you don't have the brain power. Like sometimes yeah. you're tired and that's, that's important to rec acknowledge and recognize. And it's so normal. That happens with us as dog trainers. 100%. Sometimes I've been training other people's dogs all day long. I come home and I have a five or six month old puppy and I think, oh boy, how on earth am I going to tire you out? I'm so tired. And so sometimes you don't have the brain power to do it. You just do something simple and um, it's it happens. Yeah. But it's better to do that than it is to be just letting them run 
chaotically and erasing all of the great information that you were trying to give them. Some of the most important uh, time you can spend with your dog, with your puppy, uh, or your dog in training, some of the most important information you give to your dog has nothing to do with training. That's part of what we're talking about tonight. But the surefire way to know what's right for your dog uh, at the right time is by joining our Puppy Essentials oh. program where we talk a little bit about what you can do in those in-between moments. Yes, um, our Puppy Essentials program is fully supported by our instructors. So if you are having trouble with nipping and biting or crate barking or jumping up or pulling on leash or whatever the situation is, we are able to really connect with you and your puppy and be able to give you specific advice. You know, we have a lot of a lot of awesome information out on YouTube for free, all that kind of stuff, but sometimes it's very difficult to know how to organize that information, where to start. Is that actually the right tactic for you and your puppy? You know, what we teach on YouTube is the general the general thing. Um, but as dog trainers have been doing this for 40 years, we know that there is not a one size fit all. And uh, with our online programs and our in-person programs too, um, we get to know you and your puppy and we can make little tweaks and changes that's going to allow you to be successful. So we have lots of support. Uh, we have weekly Zoom classes. Um, endless information and videos for you to watch over and over and over again but the big thing is that you get to work with our professional trainers six days a week 24 hours a day because we have students from all over the world um amazing uh and if you want more information on that check out the links in the description below for our puppy essentials program for yeah. dogs under four, four months, months and uh life skills for dogs over, over um five months. four months Michelle Davis, uh, I have a five-month-old Cavapoo who has a tendency to mount other puppies during puppy kindergarten. How do I manage this besides redirecting them? And are there other things I could do? Let's talk a little bit about timing and um, how important that is. I think it's also important to say that, like, this isn't actually that big of an issue. Um, you know, it's a pretty common thing for puppies to do when they're playing. Um, it's not necessarily something I would encourage for sure, but I also wouldn't be too worried about it because when they're puppies, they're they're trying to figure out like who the pack le leader is. You know, when they were in a litter with their own puppies and, and their mother, mom was top dog, but there's also a bit of a hierarchy within the puppies in the litter as well. So when you are um, in puppy kindergarten and the puppies are interacting, they will be trying to figure that out. And sometimes mounting other puppies is a way for them to sort of establish themselves as like being a top dog. Um, and Often what we do when, when we're doing socialization in our classes is we watch to see what's happening with the dog underneath. And if the dog is like, do, 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 I don't really care. You know, we don't worry so much about it. Um, we might just walk up and pull the puppy off and redirect them to some other some other thing to, fo to focus on. Um, if the puppy underneath is... Um, a little bit worried or put off with it, we'll address it more quickly. We might take the puppy by the collar and, um, you know, tell them to knock it off. That's enough. And then redirect them from there. Um, but it is good to interrupt it, but also it's, you know, it's, it is something that, that happens sometimes. Um, Michelle says, yes, mounting my one-year-old pup has the same issue. Um, that's a different story, Michelle. One-year-old is very different yeah. than a baby puppy. Yeah. Um, if uh, a dog older than, you know, three months, four months is doing it, that I would be correcting that behavior. I would not allow it. But baby puppies who are learning to interact with other puppies for the first time, that's a different story. Um, also talking a little bit about, you know, if, you, if you're if you recognizing that it's something that you don't want to happen and it's all in the middle of happening, it's too late. Yeah. You know, it's like our response to name conversation when we're in, in those classes, when we're trying to teach those puppies to come away from the distraction, we will get some attention, then call the dog's name and call them back. Uh, all the while, dog, we have some control you know dogs are dragging a house line or whatever um so that we ultimately Take can that. manage it um i i can't quite grab sue's uh comment i don't see it in our queue but i've taken it on the side so sue k says casey's uh, learning uh, with her uh one month heart dog supporter um casey's learning off si uh, off sit when he runs up to me but if he makes a mistake and jumps up what's the technique to teach him that this is wrong mm. 
Um, so that's great that you're working off and sit when he runs up. Um, that's good. That's, uh, that tells me that you're understanding good timing because when you're trying to teach puppies or dogs of any age not to jump, the goal is to get them doing something better than jumping before they jump. So as they're rushing up, it's important to get that sit command out really early. Um, having a house line on or a leash on can be really helpful as well. So if it's not in your hands in the moment, you can step on it with your foot so that if the puppy decides to jump they sort of get a little self-correction and they aren't actually able to succeed in jumping and when they hit the leash typically they'll go up and they'll sit back down right. and then you have that opportunity to say yay look at you sitting what a good puppy and then you can give them affection and praise while their bums on the floor that way you're not accidentally reinforcing something that you don't want um, if they do happen to jump up and they're able to you know if you, sometimes you'll say sit or off and your puppy is just too overstimulated to respond to you in that moment having a leash on is going to be really important so either a if you can get your foot out quick enough to step on it like i just mentioned that would be great if they actually get on you then you're going to take the leash with two hands and um escort them off of you and i would lift up to get them into a sitting position put slack in the leash to allow my dog to kind of use their own brain i don't want to hold my dog in a tight leash yeah. for an extended period of time because they don't have to think at all when you do that so i'm going to get them off make them sit loosen the leash don't touch them for a second. Just let them kind of calm their mind. I might use my voice in a very calm manner to help them chill out a little bit. And then I may reach down and pet once my dog is able to hold that sit. And it, it's not uncommon when you have a overzealous dog to have to repeat that a few times in the tra same training session because some dogs are just pumped and they need a little bit more of a reminder so it's just a matter of you being consistent but also saying staying pretty calm and assertive during that moment so that you're not um adding fuel to the fire by revving them up accidentally um the next point we need to talk about is expectations without teaching the shortcuts that you might be taking when it comes to exercises maybe it's like jumping up mm -hmm. maybe it's uh something Walking. Walking, yeah, that's a huge one. Uh, and this is a very common one. You know, sometimes I'll see people uh, send, a, send a comment or, or recall for sure. Send a comment or have a question saying like, oh, well, good luck trying this with my dog. As soon as we step outside, then, uh, you know, they completely lose their mind. Or, um, you know, I can't even take two steps without my dog uh, pulling. Well, this may be the case. Uh, and what you need to really understand is that you're ha you set your expectations too high for their level of understanding. Yeah. Something that a lot of people do is they think like, or I, I see like on search uh, volume, um, you know, what should, uh, how much walking can I do with an X month old dog? Or, you know, what exercises do I need to teach my one year old golden doodle? Um, and what's really important to understand and you being here in the train station, taking a deeper dive is, uh, gives me confidence, is that it's about their level of understanding, not about their age. Mm -hmm. So if you have expectations of your dog knowing something, you should, really know, understand that you've taught them what you want. When it comes to leash walking specifically, a lot of people will go out on a walk and they, you know, they maybe they have some treats, maybe they have some, some reward or something like that. And then they go to the park and they expect the dog's gonna walk in nicely on a loose leash. So they, they try to use some of the techniques that they've learned or they've, you know, they're, they're frustrated and they're like, well, my turns don't work. Maybe I'll use my voice. But the dog has no foundation of understanding. Your dog doesn't know at all that it's valuable to be in a, at this side because you've spent some time walking on the driveway. You've spent some time walking in the hallway of your apartment building. You've spent some time walking around your living room showing them that if they're here, in at your side, left or right, we don't care. Le we use left, more traditional. But le in at your side, that it's worth it. That it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring them something of value. So your expectations, are really important if you want your dog to be successful mm -hmm. when it comes to your learning. Don't take the shortcut of going out into a challenging environment or uh, skipping steps. You know, uh, your dog starts to get a foundation of understanding, and then you're like, well, that's it for the treats. And it's just not how your dog will be successful. And we yeah. want your dog to be successful. Yeah, I see the same thing. You know, I, I like to hike with my dogs. And one thing that is pretty frustrating when I go for a hike is when I'm hiking with my dogs who listen and you know all of a sudden a random dog comes flying out of the woods with no person in sight which has happened uh, which happens you know often or like a, a four-wheeler like an all-terrain vehicle comes zooming out no i'm talking specifically about the dogs that fly out and then oh, okay. that person comes around and they're right, right. calling and calling and calling and the dog has just got no recall and is yeah. getting up you know in between my dogs and it's really frustrating because that person 
I mean, they should know that their dog doesn't have a good recall, but they aren't actually, they're giving their dog an opportunity. They just want to go for the hike. So they're setting the dog free and, you know, not really caring that their dog's been ignoring them for five minutes that they've been calling or not really caring that that dog's getting into someone else's, you know, situation. And so it's really important that before you loosen the reins and we want you guys to be able to go out and enjoy your dogs but you have to do the work first so that when you put them in that situation like going for a walk or going for a hike or whatever the situation might be that when you give them the freedom you also then have the ability to get your dog back under control Um, because every time your dog gets to go and rehearse those types of things and they're getting naturally reinforced while you call them 10 hundred times from you know 100 yards away you're successful successfully um, ruining your your recall, ruining your dog's respect for you, all of those things. So it is really, really important that you think about your dog's skill level and their reliability before you just oh, that's do so the good. thing. Yeah, so good. Um, the And then you hear the four words that frustrate me the most he as a dog owner. He just wants to play. Or it's okay, he's friendly. Ugh. Like, it's just not, I mean, you're putting your dogs in like, such Sometimes a dangerous Sometimes I situation. say, my dog has worms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My dog's not friendly. I'll, I'll often, you know, we've said this. Yeah. Like, oh, it's okay. They're not friendly. Um, yeah. And we know our dogs are amazing. But well, we have one dog that's uh, quite worried about totally. new dogs. She, she's not mean but she is if she were clobbered by another dog and she gets really stressed by that and i just don't Don't want her to do that no i don't want her to feel that way so deb uh you know what we can try uh can you train my husband he goes against everything i say or do i follow all the typical training (laughs) that you teach uh yeah deb i'll tell you bring out the (laughs) e-collar yeah yeah just kidding um so this is where uh i would talk about what your goals are with you about with your dog. Um, this is where I would talk about, you know, really what, what's at the root of your training, you, you know, the uh, methodology that you're following and explain to him why what he's doing is undoing all your hard work. Yeah, I actually have to deal with this a lot, believe it or not. Uh, at the in-person school, there's lots of times where we have yes. couples that are inconsistent. And what I find seems to work really well when I need to, you know, get one of the spouses on board is talking about what it's doing to the dog. Yeah. It's yeah. not, it's, Good point. It, it's about the information that the dog is getting and that dogs are not happiest when they are getting four different sets of rules. Um, they need consistency and it that's what's most fair to the dog. Um, and so I find sometimes when you angle it that way, people are a little bit more open to, you know, hearing things because everybody loves the dog and they want to do right by the dog. Dan Luton, uh, Dan, lots of links said uh I'd like to see kale do her best toot oh um i don't know really what that means like what about like a double toot yeah that's a good one. <laughs> oh, i'm covering the holes good. no oh i was like yeah that was like an interesting toot. no that's just that didn't work <laughs> <laughs> oh, triple toot <laughs> um it was pretty airy i think s- setting your dog up to be successful this is the next point we need to talk about it's definitely a lot of work. It t- it's a lot more work than if you were to roll the dice and just do your training in whatever the current situation is. Setting your dog up to be successful means things like that we've covered already when we talked about management. It means um, maybe, uh, here's, here's an, a good one, and I see this all the time with people who are trying to teach their dog walk on, walk on leash, and they say like, well, I can't go out, I can't go anywhere unless it's busy. I can't go anywhere uh, unless there's other people. Well. The shortcut would be to you just struggle your way through that. You know, you just try to figure it out or you just tolerate the pulling, which is being inconsistent, which we talked about before. But the shortcut that you don't want to take is just going for it. Setting your dog up to be successful, which is the right approach here, might mean that you're walking after, well after dinner time because it's quieter outside. Maybe it means that you're driving 25 minutes to get somewhere where it's a big park or a soccer field or some place with space and you are finding room so that your dog isn't constantly being distracted by all the things in your environment. This is where you can really make a difference and it's also for me because remember I was a student just like you you know 15, 16, I guess 17 years ago I went to McCann Dogs with a black Labrador Retriever. 
I had, she was a wild thing. And pulling on leash, jumping up, just doing all the stuff that you- Eating eat. things. <laughs> Eating things, for sure. Doing all the stuff that you don't want your dog to do. And then my vet said, uh, listen, I can't even assess her on this table. You should go over to McCann Dogs. They have a great program, blah, blah, blah. And I find, like, oh, fine, I'll go. Um, and then I fell in love <laughs> with dog training. I applied to become an apprentice. I met Kale. The rest, as they say, is history. 15 years later, after training thousands of dogs in, in McCann, at McCann Dogs, I recognized my big mistake was I was just going through the motions. I was like doing, I didn't even know what I was doing before I knew the program, but I was like doing stuff, what I thought I should do in those busy environments at the wrong time of day. I was going up to the park and trying to teach my dog to stay without having- Making the, it too hard. I was making it way too hard for her, but it was easy. You know, I could just go when I wanted to. And um, what I learned is that like, you, to take that like a little bit more effort, uh, I saw like exponential results, like yeah. working a little bit harder to find the right time, to find the right place, to understand what the what I should be doing. And I got results. I think that's why I fell in love with the training so quickly. Mm -hmm. Like I just was like, this is incredible because it's working. Yeah. Like, I would have never imagined. Yeah. And um, it, it makes a huge difference, but it was more work. So don't take the shortcut of just repeating the stuff that's not working, of just going to the same places where your dog's already overwhelmed. Get your butt out there and find somewhere where you can be successful. And maybe this spot doesn't work. Maybe the new spot doesn't work. Find another spot. We have students from like literally all over the world. And we have some incredible shots of like training in Australia and New Zealand and um, you know, some like really like uh, arid countries, people are training their dogs. And you know, the effort you put in is so worth it in the end because you start to get the dog you wanted. You get the dog that like is actually cares about you and actually, you know, will retrieve and like wants to listen. That's really why we're all here. That's why we're sitting here in front of you today mm -hmm. to try to help you to reach those goals. Now, not only are we setting our dogs up to be successful, but there's there are a million natural training opportunities. I use a million loosely. Yeah, there's like 10, maybe 15 natural training opportunities <laughs> that present themselves to you over the course of the day for anybody who owns a puppy. This is where the, this is the bridge between like real life and training. Mm -hmm. uh, and those natural training opportunities are, if you don't take advantage of, of them, you'll find that like the application of your training, it's, it's slower. But if you identify these natural training opportunities and you use them to train through, which is more work, this is where your puppy starts to go, it's a light bulb moment. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. okay, I have to sit and wait at the door and then you go outside and yeah. then like, so let's talk about a couple of natural training opportunities that we'd use with puppies. Yeah, there's there's so many things you can do. You can um, integrate, you know, some structure of your training into your everyday routine with your dog so that um, later on down the road, you have, you know, a reliable response. Uh, Ken just hinted on it, something like, you know, having your dog sit at the door before you open the door and then making sure that you walk out with a loose leash. Um, I had a natural training opportunity the other day with five. Um, Amazon guy came to drop uh, drop some boxes off and um, five started barking at him because the guy just started walking up our driveway and uh, I didn't have him on a leash at the time because I wasn't expecting him to be there. So I just called him back. He came back great. I grabbed a leash out of my car, hooked it on, and we just went off to the side of the driveway and I just worked on having him hold a sit as the guy dropped off the package and he stood there and said hello to me and uh, five barked again. I just placed him back into a sit. I think I did that twice and all of a sudden five looked at him and looked at me and looked at him and was like, okay, this is a good situation. And I thanked him. I said, Th thanks for helping me train my dog. Um, but rather than just letting my dog, you know, do his own thing, I thought, well, I need to do something yeah, about this yeah, right now yeah. while the situation is here. So you want to take advantage of those things. And, and if those situations can be repeated a few times, you're going to have an entirely different behavior from your dog. Um, you know, when people come to your house or you could even, like, I'm all talk, sort of referencing distractions right now, um, but you could also do things like every time you get your dog out of your crate, uh, out of their crate, what do you do? Are you just letting them out and letting them jump all over you? Or could you take that opportunity to work on some self-control? Maybe they have to wait in their crate for you to be able to open the door and get their house yeah. line on before coming out. Doing that day after day after day 
changes your dog's um, view of you. Mm -hmm. They start to view you as somebody they need to listen to, which means when they come out of the crate, you have a different minded dog. So try to think about your everyday situations and how you can incorporate some simple training techniques. They do not have to be hard or complicated. Um, and that repetition naturally every day will be great. We still have our two youngest dogs that were raised in this house as puppies. Um, one of them is six now, Beeline, and she still waits at the bottom of our stairs before running up but we forget about her all of the time because that was something that we did so consistently with her so yeah um i think one of the things the advantages that we have like not only do we know the right information to give the dog but i was just thinking as you're talking about that like maybe that's exactly why uh dog trainers who are on top of things um can train their dogs more quickly because they they recognize that moment that you had. Yeah. Like if every dog owner had, uh, you know, could take advantage of these opportunities, they'd have a dog who doesn't get to rehearse the bad stuff, but also when the dog isn't sure or like is just choosing something, that owner's like, oh, I know what I want them to do. This is the moment. This is the moment that I need to give them great information. Mm -hmm. Could make a massive difference. And that's a huge part of what we teach in our programs, yeah. both in class and online. It's like giving you the tools. Not It's not just about what happens when a dog comes up, It's uh, or whatever, whatever the distraction is. It's about, here's, here's like big picture. Here's what you need to be looking for. Yeah. Here's when you need to do something about it. Here's what you need to do. Yeah. It just it fills the tool belt with all sorts yeah. of things. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say. That's the most important thing. It's not just training the dog. It's those small things about, you know, when should you praise? When should right. you be quiet? Right. Totally. When should you loosen the leash? When should you tighten the leash? When should you feed? When should you not feed? How close should you be? There's all of these little details that we teach you to do yeah. um, that make the process go faster for the dog. And that's yeah. why our dogs get trained so quickly is because sure. we, we're mass, you know, we read body language and we have good timing and, and all that fun stuff but um our job as your instructor as your coach is, is to give you those tools as well i do like the idea of a, a coach you know because yeah. we really are uh helping people like discover their dog training ability mm -hmm. and and some people are harder than others yeah so that's the fun part that is true from melissa uh our for some week old two and a half sometimes pound, we're therapists as extra, well that's very true <laughs> extra sm uh, small breed how do you touch a host line collars not recommended and what treats do you use so I'd be interested what the extra small breed is. We have, uh, I'll never forget, oh darn, I can't remember the dog's name, but I'll never forget the adorable little teacup uh, chihuahua in class. Um, sat at the front of the room so in our Life Skills 1 class many, many years ago. Um, but uh, wore a collar, like that puppy wore a collar. Now, mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about this situation and, and if you'd have any different advice for her. Yeah. Um Two and a half pounds extra. That sounds very similar to the same size as our. We have a toy poodle. Yeah. She's nine years old now, and she weighs about six or seven pounds now. I would say. But, but when she, she was little. She, when she was that age, I would think that she was about the same. Um, we did have a, a collar on her. We actually had a cat collar on her because that's all that would fit her at the time. Um, and we used, um, we attached a house line uh, to that. Um, you know, in some cases, if dogs have like actual trachea issues or things like that, you oh. could um, attach a long line to a harness. Um, but we would not recommend that you train the dog on a harness because then you don't have control of the head. If it's a matter of the dog just like hanging around the house that might be okay but if you're actually going to do any formal training um you want to get the dog used to wearing a collar um again remember we're not yanking on this line you know it's it's just sort of an, an extra appendage an extra attachment um so in our experience with dogs that size um we are able to um use a well-fit you know good quality collar um with a with a line attached without issue we were just talking about um, some of the nuances of dog training and yep. you know how the truth is inherently in the nuances. Uh, from Joan, one of our heart dog supporters, can all those nuances be taught and details be taught mm. to owners through an online course? Yes. And I love this because this is our focus when it comes to yeah. online training. Yeah, it, it was a while before we came out with online classes because our goal is to provide really, really quality teaching. And so we worked really hard to be able to communicate these small details to our online um, classes, which is why we have so many different avenues of teaching within the program, whether it's video. Uh, we also have a support group. People upload videos of themselves training um, their own dogs. And then we're able to literally watch the video. And within seconds, we can say, 
your timing was off or try holding your hand this way to feed or whatever it might be. Um, and then we also do like super big deep dives um, on our Zoom calls once a week as well. Uh, so yes, absolutely. That's super yeah. important to us. Like you have actual dog trainers going through helping you yeah. with your dog. Um, that's, I mean. And we're nitpicky. We're yeah. nitpicky. As we should be. Yeah. You know, that's how we're going to get you to be successful. Um, I notice uh, our uh, moderators on the uh, screen here uh, saying, uh, Jane, Jane, can you message in the chat your question and we'll pass it along and then we can answer it because I know Jane has been dropping massive super chats here, dropping super chats like crazy, including a $50 super chat. I can't thank you enough. That's, re that's, that's really, really nice. Way too much. Um, okay, we got that. We're uh, up to speed. The, when we're talking, I mean, we we're just talking about uh, online training or any training, our in-class online otherwise. Uh, the shortcut I would say a lot of people take, and I'm not sure why. I mean, I did the same thing, I, and I, I don't know what my motivation was, but not really having a plan. Like, I didn't really have a plan. I just sort of went out, and then when something happened. I think sometimes people don't even know that they should have a plan. Maybe. Like yeah. They don't purposely not have a plan. They just yeah. don't realize they should have a plan. Well, and honestly, <laughs> a, a turning point. Um, they just want to have a dog and do things with the dog. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have this like aspirational goal. I have a dog. Like, I should walk it. I have totally. a dog. I should take it to the park. Yeah. Or you it, can do that, but you shouldn't do it <coughs> yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or they see they, they wanted the dog to fetch. So they just throw something and yes. have some expectation. The dog's going to bring it back. They're and magically drop it. born to know how to respond to their right. name and fetch a ball. Well, if they are called a retriever, you know, I could see how someone would make that mistake. But I'll tell you, some of uh, the most fun training videos we've put up on this channel with retrieving in it have included retrievers because, you know, the dog just doesn't <laughs> know the details yet. Um, but not having a plan. Uh, you know, the other thing that just struck me was um, structure, like the value dogs have for structure. And uh, that's probably, that, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's the realization you need to make is that understanding that a dog needs black and white mm -hmm. um, information and structure that will entirely change their yeah. level of understanding. And in fact, when you provide some structure for them, they're all of a sudden they see you as a leader. They're like, wow, this person. They love knows what routine too. Yeah, yeah. They love routine. They love when things are clear. Like we often say, dogs like when things are black and white. Dogs like when the rules and expectations are clearly laid out, and they can kind of go through their little routine. It, it's shocking to me how. Um, how the dogs get into a routine and we see this with our own dogs we have six dogs and that we definitely have a routine when you have that many dogs we have a routine but um you know it's really really important and and we create that routine by having a lot of structure in how we raise our dogs whether that's through the training that they get um through their our off time that they get the amount of freedom in their house that they get the type of exercise they're walking all of that stuff um, and we talk about the structure a lot because it's very common for us to see um dogs behave really well in in one situation and then struggle in other situations and use usually the common denominator is the person isn't providing the same structure or expectation mm -hmm. in those different locations whether it be yeah. at dog dog school and then at home some dogs are great in one spot and not great at the other but when you watch that person train they're doing totally different things and so the dog says okay well, this makes sense i have this rule over here and i have no rule and this rule over here so um that structure is really important absolutely um now i hope this gives you a little bit more clarity when we're talking about success is built over time, not overnight. You know, it's it's all about taking the right steps. And when we talk about uh, no shortcuts when it comes to supervision, not taking shortcuts when it comes to management, uh, being inconsistent. Uh, Lori, okay, good question. I can send it up there. But uh, what, what do you mean by plan? Knowing uh, how you're going to act in key situations or like a business plan week one, week two? Oh, I love this. Yeah. Great question. I mean both. Yeah. Uh, I mean both, Lori. Yeah. Yeah. So um, knowing how to act in key situations is definitely what having a plan and structure is so that you can stop unwanted behaviors and you can form new ones. But also like in our program, for example, we literally do have lesson one, two, three, four, and life skills, we have uh, eight weeks of lessons because we work through a really progressional program. So we can start with the foundation and then we you know, work on that and then we add another step and then add another step and then another step. So as a dog goes through, you get that reliability. We go through a proofing phase so that the dog is able to do that thing maybe without the lure of food or with you at a distance or with adding distractions. So the lessons do 
um, have structure like a business plan, like you said, week one, this, week one, two, that, that helps our students stay on track. That helps you to sort of know that you have a, a, a set goal or a certain homework or tasks that you need to accomplish for that week but also you need to plan for all the in-betweeny stuff you know mm -hmm. when your dog randomly barks at that thing or they have an accident in the house or whatever it might be that you have a, a plan for that so we both of those things are, are exactly what we're talking about um also um a lot also. of people a lot of people run into the problem where let's say they're on uh week three uh, with five of their skills uh, but the sixth skill, they're just not seeing success at. What did at. you say? Sixth skill, they're not seeing success at. Let's just say whatever. Let's say you're walking on a leash, jumping up, training's going great, but sit and accept praise like they, your dog can't mm -hmm. sit at your side. It it it's not to your advantage to move to week four with that skill. Yeah. So there's a you know there's a little bit of um there's a little bit of again I don't want to use overuse word nuance but like there's a little bit of um. You're welcome, Lori. You know, you have to be careful with the progressions that you're making. And this is where a professional dog trainer can say like, okay, hold on a second. You know what, work on this for another couple of days or you need to change this in your training, mm -hmm. turn your hand forward. Uh, you know, don't don't say yes so early. And that's where the breakthrough happens because yeah. you you're, all your other skills are great, but this one thing, <laughs> this one thing is just not working. And it could be something very simple that can be uh, fixed for you and your dog. And that's the kind of success we want to, Kind of success I had as a student. Sue says you should try and say that six times fast. I forget what it was. Sixth skill successfully, whatever it was. Um, taking the shortcut Sixth. of not uh, having the right expectations when you're teaching, setting your dog up for failure. That's a shortcut because it's a little bit of work. Not taking advantage of the natural training opportunities. Kale gave a great example in this show, and um, that that boy oh boy, mm. that is the bridge. That is the bridge to success. Uh, yeah, and having a plan. And a schedule, uh, developing a plan for what to we do in the moment. We can practice the Amazon guide distraction a lot with the rate that you uh, order packages. To that's the house. true, absolutely. It gives me all kinds of time to practice. Yeah, luckily that's part of the that's part of the goal. I think <laughs> do some training. You just keep ordering packages so that I have more dog training opportunities. That's right. Yeah, with puppy and training. I'm just as guilty home. as he is, so I feel it's true. Okay, I didn't want to say anything. Throwing him under the bus. I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> But I want to thank you guys. Huge thank you to our instructors that are in the chat tonight. Huge thank you to our Heart Dog members. And a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us here with the questions and the comments. In two weeks, we're going to be hanging out with some UK dog trainer friends of ours doing an agility seminar. So mm -hmm. we won't be back here in the train station, but we'll see you here a month from now. And with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest of my friends, well, that is up to you. We do these live streams to educate you, but more importantly, to motivate you. You can have the dog that you've always wanted, but it's just gonna take you a little bit of work. I would know because I was just like you. Long before I became a dog trainer, I was a frustrated dog owner, but the skills that I learned at McCann's changed my life. Now we have hundreds of videos here on our YouTube channel to help you to have a well-behaved four-legged family member. But if you want someone to guide you through the dog training process, then you should check out our Puppy Essentials program for puppies under six months. If your dog is over six months, then you could join our Life Skills program and our instructors are gonna help to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible in a really supportive environment. All of the knowledge about dog training in the world won't help you to be successful unless you get up and you start training. The real question is, what are you going to train next? Happy training.